Thanks so much for joining us for our fireside chat number six. I'll have uh, Sway, one of the owners of Beer Wall on Pen and Beer Wall on Prince, to kick this off by telling us a little bit about himself and then telling us a little bit about the two gentlemen sitting uh, next to him. Yeah, so I mean, as everyone knows by now, the idea started as this uh, sort of a college project when I was finishing up at Albright. Um, I was working um, at Penske Truck Leasing at the time. I was finishing up my degree at night, and uh, I just discovered this South Poor Tap Room that they were pretty big in the West Coast. And I did a little research on if there was anything like it here in PA. Um, and this is probably December of 2017 when I discovered the, the concept. I, I, I found Pour My Beer and a bunch of other vendors. Um, I started a business plan shortly after that. Um, I met Josh probably what April May 2018 April yeah. or May yeah April, May 2018 is when I met Josh probably a month or two later I met Ben who he introduced me to so I had you know going into this I knew I've never worked in a restaurant right so I just had this crazy idea to bring this really cool cutting edge self pour tap room to Berks County um, but I knew I needed to have I needed a team I needed some kind of credibility um, in that space which I didn't have so um, Going into that, one of my, I guess one of my investors um, knew Josh personally and connected me with Josh, and he's my Bitcoin guy. I always like saying that he invested in Bitcoin like seven years ago when everyone probably should have. But um, yeah, he, connected, he yeah he yeah he invested in Bitcoin a while ago. But anyways, he knew Josh, and he was like, dude, I got the perfect guy to to sort of lead the way and really help us, you know, get this off the ground. Um, so yeah, I met Josh, like I said, spring of 2018. And that's pretty much when it started. The business plan was done. We were just looking for locations together. All three of us actually, we were um, we were looking at spaces. Well, I wanted to go to Phoenixville at first, but we looked at a bunch of locations and nothing was really working out. And then we always knew if we were gonna open locally here in, in, in Reading, West Reading would be the perfect location. It's a thriving area. I, I gave you that little walkthrough before we started. It's a nice little main street. There's other cafes and breweries and eateries and things like that. So. Um, we discovered the space in August of 2018. Um, I, I think we signed our lease agreement in October. October yeah, October 2018, we signed a lease. Construction started probably in November. Um, I'd say construction was done by like February, March of 2019, and we opened our doors uh, April uh, 2019. So uh, it's and we were crushing it. It's been it's been uh, it's just been crazy. Well, we're excited to learn a little bit more about how you guys are crushing it later. Just out of curiosity, fill me in on two things here for the background. How did you pitch uh, Josh and Ben? And you guys can actually tell me what was what was it that really made you like, okay, I think this guy is not just a dreamer. This is going to happen and it's going to be a cool reality. What made you want to join him? Uh, yeah, so uh, Josue and... One of our business partners came to me in May of 2018, and originally, uh, I, I won't lie, I, I took the whole idea as kind of with with a grain of sand. Uh, I wasn't sold on it until they kind of showed me all the statistics and the business plan they were working on and how the actual Pour My Beer technology worked, and I kind of fell in love with it. I've been a restaurateur for a long time, since my teenage years, and uh, at that point I'd been managing the same bar as their GM for my sixth year, and I was okay and looking for an opportunity to move forward in my career, and Josue and the team kind of came to me and sold me on the technology and allowed me to build the concept for the menu, the environment around the usage of Pour My Beer technology, which was just an incredible opportunity for me because uh, I've always been a believer that a concept and something incredible like what we do brings people to a restaurant, uh, but it's the food and the service that establishes regulars and creates the ever-growing opportunity for you to brand and create all of your restaurants 
Um, and then shortly after, Osway brought me on, and we really got the ball rolling on property like he was talking about. I knew we needed a an incredible executive chef because, like I said, uh, people come back, people bring their friends because of the food. And I had a loose menu in my head, and Benjamin Hinkle, I was sitting to my right, our executive chef, his parents uh, lived right next to the bar I was working at, and he was a regular there, and I lived right next to the bar he was the head chef at, so I was a <laughs> regular up there. We saw each other often after shifts, and I pitched him on, hey, come have breakfast with myself and this dude, Sway, that I want you to meet, and I showed him what I was working on and the concept we were looking at and said, you know, I'm literally willing to let you take 100% control of the direction I want to go food-wise, create the sauces, the dishes, really, you know, build the kitchen. And, like, I had a huge opportunity in front of me. Uh, you know, he, he kind of jumped at that, and I'll turn it over to uh, Ben now. Uh, yeah, I, um, I have known Josh for a very long time. I only met Sway um, at the beginning of this project, and I could tell right away that his passion for what he was about to do was all there, and he was all aboard, but he just needed people who had the direction in the way of what to do logistically, what to do, how things are going to run properly in the restaurant, how things are going to function in the flow of the restaurant more than anything. Um, and when Josh, Josh came to me and said, hey, I just want you to sit down so we can kind of talk through and figure out, hey, this is what we're thinking, this is what we want to do, and I fell in love with the idea um, just of the point that, I had been running a kitchen uh, for the last seven years, kind of along the same lines as Josh, um, working for somebody else, doing other things. Um, I've, I've been doing this since I was 13 uh, in the industry, so I uh, really started my way up and hit, hit a point where I was looking for my next big venture, something that's going to keep me creatively excited to push myself day in and day out. Um, and with the space that they found, with the concept, with everything, I was sold right in, head over heels for it, and kind of hit the ground running from there. Can you talk to us a little bit about uh, financing, how you pulled this project off, and then head to your second one? You can reveal more information about that, yeah. too. Yeah, so the fine, I mean, the financing beast, um, it, it, was, it, it was pretty daunting. It was, you know, it was pretty much going to banks, um, I was just learning all about the SBA, um, their requirements, and, and what we needed to have in place in order to even be considered for, for an approval. So, you know, besides the obvious, you know, good credit, strong business plan, and pro formas and all of that, um, the big thing is, you know, they want you to, to pretty much come up with 20%. So I always tell anyone that's interested or when I'm giving advice, it's like, listen, it's almost like when you're buying a house or anything else. Um, if you have a good team around you and, and, and a good business model and, um, you know, the business plan is there. If you're able to raise, you know, 20% of your total project costs and you have a bank that believes in you or, or at least a loan officer who's really, you know, willing to go to, go to bat for you, which, you know, luckily we, we had, um, that's what ended up happening. You know, we did, we did get denied by, by the first two banks. I think it was MNT Bank at first. Um, we, we thought we were going to get an approval and that ended up not happening. And then it was, was it Tom Vist, I want to say? Uh, was Tom Viss was the second bank that denied us? Either way, there was yeah, number. yeah, there was another bank that denied us, and as you say, the third time was a charm. So the second bank that denied us, the main guy was really trying to push for us because he believed in it. Um, but he, you know, he didn't have the, the final say on whether we would get approved for the loan or not. So he introduced me to his wife, and his wife was actually um, a higher up at Fulton Bank locally. So we sat down one morning at a, at a local Starbucks. I brought my business plan. I brought everything. Um, and she just went to bat. You know, she presented it to her underwriters, um, to the vice president of, of SBA lending at Fulton Bank. His name was Michael Donato. And that started the process over a few weeks. And we finally, uh, you know, we were able to get an approval. And, and we, we closed on the loan probably two, two or three weeks before we actually opened our doors here. And you mind if I hop in on that? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, to, to further elaborate and to help people who are looking for financing, uh, financing is very tough when it's a restaurant concept, uh, depending on the bank you go to. And we faced uh, not only that obstacle, uh, like Josue was saying, with the first bank that really gave us the time of day, 
uh, the individual was very interested and just couldn't get approval from the team of higher ups as they just thought too much of a risk solely because it was a restaurant. And that's why he ended up uh, pitching us to his wife who was able to sell it to her team above her. And thankfully it worked out. The other thing that really kind of inhibited and made it harder for us was in 2018, we had the government shutdown and basically everything came to a stop. That was really our issue at the start was we were on a roll, everything was looking good. And then the SBA basically stopped working and by the time things started getting back up, it, it gave too much time for things to change and we had to kind of start over. Uh, but really, uh, you know, what I tell anyone is perseverance. You're, you're going to face obstacles, especially financially, if you want to start a restaurant and staying calm, having a really good team that you vetted in place beforehand is key to making sure you're going to overcome those obstacles that are in your way. Uh, I'll turn it back this way uh, for, for Prince Street, but Prince Street was definitely a much different and easier opportunity for us. And I'll let him talk about that. And then I'll probably elaborate on why different ways of opening a business can be beneficial or not. Yeah, it's funny you shared that story. I, I remember sitting at, at Barnes & Noble's with him <laughs> after the second time we were denied by a bank. And he's looking at me, and I could just tell it. He's like, man, like this is this is bad. Like we, There were times, I'm not going to lie, like there was probably close to some, some tears being shed, and we were just very scared. You know, we were pretty much going all in with the project. We had started some things here already with, with some capital that we raised with family and friends. Um, but like I said, we persevered. We got the loan, and it all worked out. And then as far as... um. The Lancaster, that was, man, again, just complete, just right time, right place. We had just had our, our, our quarterly partners meeting. Um, and after during the meeting, we're like, all right, let's start looking for a second location. We hopped on LoopNet literally that afternoon. We both saw the same posting and we're like, dude, Lancaster, like that, that was always it. Like that was like the next logical step from West Reading. Um, and we, you know, shot him an email and that's how that started. It was just very organic. Um, their, you know, their owner uh, owns a brewery in Lancaster. He also owned, at the time, was called Poor, which was a high-end restaurant, which is the space that we that we took over. And he just wanted to sort of, you know, get out of the restaurant scene, focus more on the brewery, and spend more time with family. So we got in at a great opportunity. It was a turnkey operation. Um, I mean, literally, all we had to do was, you know, raise money for the liquor license and the beer wall technology, of course, a couple other things that we had to refine in the restaurant, but. Uh, we were able to open that with with no you know no debt no, no loans um, just raise money through uh, through family and friends. Just out of curiosity, please mention to the rest of the attendees here what was the price for the liquor license in Pennsylvania? It's one of the uh, highest. They vary. So so the yeah. so liquor license definitely vary across the state. Uh, Pennsylvania is a Commonwealth state, so there's only a certain amount of licenses per county, and then in each county. Uh, each township has a certain amount of licenses uh, per, per capita, and it's tough to transfer them even. So it, it really depends. Uh, what I can say is in our area of Berks County, they range from as inexpensive as 100000 to 150000 In Philadelphia, they're actually cheaper because of how many there are. But in the nicest areas where you can open huge bars like Phoenixville, which is Montgomery, Chester County, Lancaster, they can go anywhere from the lowest being 250 to the highest being 400. Uh, and that's just a general R restaurant license. Uh, there's much cheaper licenses that you can get, uh, but those are wine and beer licenses only, which... You know, I, I don't think we're going to break into uh, the benefits of liquor versus beer today. Uh, and also brewery licenses that allow you as long as you're making and selling 50 percent of what you brew in house. You can also carry any Pennsylvania liquor, wine or other beer, which is the cheapest license. And I think that's why you've seen in Commonwealth states like in Richmond, Virginia, 
or in Pennsylvania, so many small breweries taking advantage of those licenses. Let's move to the space layout and uh, let's move to the beer wall itself because I don't think you guys only have the beer on the on the tabs, but you can you can uh, let me know more about that. I, I I have have I have an impression that you have wine as well, but let's let's hear more about that. I've never visited. So what do you actually well, offer on your self pour tabs? So we offer 38 uh, self service beers. We do not currently offer wine. It's something we have thought about and will probably do depending on the areas we continue to look at as we've explored property in Westchester, property in the Lehigh Valley, um, throughout Pennsylvania. It really comes down to when you open a restaurant, knowing your clientele, knowing the area. When you go to put wine on tap, it means a little bit different of a setup, a little bit different of gas pressure going to it and some of the pieces incorporated with it. And we've just decided that, you know, we don't sell enough wine in-house for it to justify as we do offer a full bar of wine and liquor. Uh, we, we sell a ton of liquor. You know, uh, our beer sales are definitely massive, uh, but having a restaurant nice and has been beneficial for that. So would, would you mind sharing a percentage wise, like what are the beer uh, sales compared to the liquor? Uh, our alcohol sales to food are 60-40, and I'd say of the alcohol sales, it's probably 75-25 uh, on beer. However, on Fridays and Saturdays when we're at our busiest, it can really fall to about 60-40 beer to liquor. Um, and uh, again, it's kind of knowing the area you're in and how you've conceptually drawn up your idea of using self-service technology and how you wanted to take advantages of staffing and labor costs versus what you wanted to present to your customers. Okay. In some some of the previous fireside chats, we had uh, several of our customers that mentioned that, you know, they're doing really well in terms of cocktails. Uh, so actually some of them, uh, the most sold drinks, for example, for Stanley Beer Hall was a margarita that they have on self brew tabs. Do you experience customers asking you for these, uh, for either cocktails on tap, kombucha, or wine? Uh, not particularly, and it's really because of the area we're in. Uh, in Berks County, being in West Reading, directly across the street from us is a bar called Wine Down and a bar called Whiskey Room. There was a kombucha shop a block away. There's a meadery two blocks away. There's uh, two different breweries that have their own micro brews within a three block radius. There's so much to offer that people specifically will go to those places if that's exactly what they're looking for. Here at Beer Wall, while we have a very diverse, a, a plethora of different styles, and we found that you, know, you really need to, to have a huge crowd and a diverse layout of ages and gender and such coming into your bar, you need to have a Pilsner, a Lager, a Hefeweizen, Sours, Stouts, you know, not just IPAs, and, you know, we can run some domestics. Yeah. Uh, in Lancaster, it's Seltzer and Ciders. In Lancaster, it's very similar that we're going into an area where there's so much going on that uh, we, we offer a very diverse selection but not anything so specific to take away from our competition across the street that is very unilateral to it. I've always been a believer it's collaboration, not competition. You want to be in an area that's grown but not overgrown, where that attracts a ton of people to come in and say, oh, I'm going to visit one, two, three, four places. And sure, you want to be the place that they certainly want to visit, that they want to have dinner, and that they want to spend 30 minutes longer than any other bar. Uh, but it's important to be in an area where there are multiple places that'll bring people around. Yeah, definitely. Uh, do you can you tell us what's your most popular item on both the beer menu and the food menu? On a lot food. Uh, well, our food menu, our most popular item by far, is uh, we do a duck fat fry. So it's French fries fried in duck fat tossed in truffle powder and sea salt, 
Um, it gets topped with Parmesan cheese and scallions, and it's served with a side of uh, lemon garlic aioli. Um, as far as our sandwiches goes, um, we're about to fully add to our, our menu during this quarantine shutdown stuff. Uh, we added a hot chicken sandwich. Um, so it's a deep fried uh, hot chicken Tennessee style. Um, real nice sandwich with lettuce, tomato, pickles. Um, it's going over really well. And I think that's been our hot ticket item for um, our kind of breakdown menu for our quarantine. And I think moving forward, going back into a phase of quote normalcy, um, that's something that's going to be a, a real heavy ticket item for us. Mm -hmm. Since yeah. you mentioned the quarantine and uh, touch that topic just a little bit, uh, did you simplify your menu significantly now for, for yeah? Very much so. Um, we tried to do things a little more conducively. Um, originally, when we opened back up, we did take a small hiatus um, just to kind of organize ourselves and get things together. Um, when we came back, we simplified our menu by, I would say, at least half um, uh, just to make it a little more easy for to-go food and to uh, due to the needs of larger families, we added a section to do um, family-style platters that would feed four to six people. Um, so instead of ordering a bunch of different things, you get one big family-sized platter, um, and that would kind of help out with uh, moving business for us. Mm -hmm. Ben, are you happy with the layout of the place, like the, the way the kitchen is positioned? Is that where you would have it if you could do it all over again? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes and no. I'm touching some sensitive areas. <laughs> Every chef and he's going to say the same thing. I could always use a bigger kitchen. Yeah. I could always use a bigger kitchen. I could always use more storage space. But with what we have and the quality of product we put out of, out of my kitchen with my staff, I am more than happy with what I have. Awesome, awesome. I think that's a good answer. <laughs> um, as for as just for a last question for the layout itself, um, so I know you guys have a traditional bar, and as you mentioned earlier, you have the two walls. They are separated. One is bigger, right downstairs, and the other is smaller upstairs. Can you just talk a little bit about both, uh, or I mean, actually, first about the traditional bar? Um, you know, why is it there? How beneficial it is? You mentioned a little bit about the liquor, um, so. Would you would you recommend that? Would you be against that? What's your take on this? Oh man, I mean honestly, yeah, I'll let Josh reiterate too. Um, we, we were kind of going back and forth in the beginning, um, but I think it just came down to our name. You know, we're, we're the beer wall. You know, we want to be known for great beer. You know, on the taps, um, and at the same time, you know, I think there was still something to be said. You know, about the bartender, right? You know, you walking in, you know, you know, just having that initial greeting from someone, um, and just having that option. The option where we are self, you know, self-serve beer, but you know, we do have a traditional bar where you can order wine, and you know, your bartender could still get to know you and have a conversation and recommend different craft cocktails and and things of that nature. Um, so for me, it was just really combining the new cutting-edge technology with a very traditional model. You know, I didn't really want to pick and choose and just get rid of the bar completely. Um, I think where we're at, like Josh said, it's it's I think it's still. Uh, Sort of a blue collar town and i just didn't want to alienate any demographic or any type of customers that might walk in and um it might have just rubbed them rubbed them the wrong way if we would have not had a bar so um we just decided to you know go all in with the concept with beer and then just complement it with uh with wine and cocktails behind the bar and then as far as the first and second floor the second floor was always a game room so as soon as we sat down with our, our contractors and the install the draft installers and we knew we could we could pull off a beer wall on the second floor. I mean, it, it was a no-brainer. Um, like I said, when we go up there on Fridays and Saturday nights, that's like sort of like, I don't want to see the man cave, but that's like the hangout spot. You know, the games are on and everyone's just having a good time. It sounds like for you, you didn't have to do too much work with really making sure that they know it's up there because it seems like some of the arts is already leading them and seems like it's already now at this point it's a noun spot right so you already have traffic coming in which means it probably makes the new visitor wonder like hey what's up there so they'll go in check it out and that way they can see like oh there is actually more beers here and there is some arcades right or do you have a staff member to reiterate this to newcomers and say like hey there is more beers up there is that what you so, do one of, one of our huge things like uh Osway started to allude to is that uh, we wanted to be 100% sure, and I, I'd say to anyone, depths of service is important no matter what you do. We put the bar right by the front door because the second the door opens, you want to hear, hi, welcome to Beer Wall. Uh, and, and 
every one of our staff members, whether you're sat at a table, whether you hear that and you go to the bar, whether you make it 10 feet to the beer wall and somebody's there to help you, have kind of a 30 second spiel down to tell you all about the restaurant and how the concept works. And especially those first couple mo uh, months open, any one of my employees would tell you they said, you know, the same thing. However, they had it in their head 10,000 times because it was important with this being such a new concept to the area to not only tell people about the area, but to also incorporate. So, you know, there's 28 taps downstairs, 10 more upstairs in our free game room. If you're interested in food, you know, in that 30 seconds, they were really able to help people. And everyone was so grateful to not just learn, OK, this is where to get my card, how to use the system, uh, but also what I what I can do within this location because the amount of people for the first eight months we were open, who would open the door and go, do you have food? Do you have wine? What's upstairs? You know, all those questions. Uh, when you're busy, you had to have something that everyone knew to make the whole concept work. You know, there's a million different ways to use Pour My Beers technology, and to me, they're all right, uh, depending on the area you're going into. Uh, our concept was built around knowing our demographic of Berks County and Lancaster and this area of Pennsylvania and wanting to make sure we incorporated a aspect of customer service. If we'd opened in Philadelphia or Pittsburgh, like we might, you know, one, two, ten years from now, uh, we've already discussed the concept will be uh, different, not tremendously different, but we'll switch things around because of the size of the city and the way you know tourists even come in and out of an area like that. But for this, we wanted it to be a home bar, and we love that if you walk in on a Friday night and you go from the front to the back, you'll see sitting next to each other a table of 24-year-olds next to a family of four in their 40s with two kids, and next to them is a couple that's 65 years old that are eating duck fat fries and talking about how great their lobster mac and cheese was. What's your process of checking the customers in? Uh, as, as far as I remember, your POS is Micros, is that correct? Correct, yep. Okay. Um, and so how does it work with, with Micros? Do you check customers in right there at the door? And please also mention the checkout process. Uh, so I absolutely love Micros. I'm, I'm a huge supporter of them as them and Aloha have uh, really been my two favorite companies I've worked with over 20 years of being in a restaurant. Uh, Micros' customer service is second to none. Uh, anytime we've ever had any kind of issue, even if it's not on their side, you call their number and they respond within two minutes. Uh, we use Micros' handheld units as well as uh, hardwired point of sales. We, we try to follow step of service code when coming into the restaurant. A restaurant, whether it's the kitchen or the bar, is like a funnel. You can throw as much as you want in the top, but it's only coming out at one speed. So when we've got 100 and something people, 200 people coming in on a Saturday, we have a host. Uh, so the first question is, are you guys just drinking? Or are you looking for a table? Uh, by putting people at a table and then having a server come over and traditionally explain to them how to use the wall, we've just slowed down how many people are immediately getting their card versus being greeted and getting their card so we don't have a backup at the wall. People who are just coming in and drinking, and especially people who have been here before, no, walk in, turn right, there's the bar, I'm going to hand them my credit card, they're going to hand me a beer card, and I'm good to go. I probably won't have to talk to anyone for 30 minutes, an hour, however long it takes me to use uh, that card. Really what was important to me was making sure, like I said, we, we followed a, a well-written diagram that's worked in restaurants for years, even though it was a new concept of not trying to have too many check-in spots or too many people just trying to check you in the second you walked in the door to not overpower the wall. 38 taps sounds like a lot, uh, and honestly to me, it's the perfect amount. 
I don't, I, I hate to say I don't understand too much over 50 unless you're in, you know, Chicago, LA, where you can go through that much beer that quickly. Uh, but you have to know how many people are going to get to that wall at the same time, the same way any chef has to know how many tables you sat at the same time so they can be aware of how much food, how many tickets are going to come back and try to have some kind of sibilance in order to keeping their line cooks moving at the right speed. Um, how many check would, checks would you say that you're able to open um, how, have on a busy day, one busy day? On a busy Saturday, uh, it, it depends on how quickly we're also closing them out. On festival days, we've had 500 checks open at the same time. We probably keep about 1,500 cards in-house uh, at any given point, or we try to. Uh, you know, the most cards we've ever probably had out on a festival day where people are going in and out, sitting in the restaurant, playing games upstairs, is probably... 225 people in the physical restaurant drinking open tabs, but 500 open tabs between stuff not closed out, people who took their card down the street or, and are coming back, or people that just forgot to pay, which is why uh, you know we don't start any tab without having a credit card interaction first. The way our micro system is set up, the second you swipe, you hit new beer card and swipe a beer card, the first thing that comes up is a giant button that says authorized credit card. Uh, the only time we skip that is uh, if it's for, you know, host sway or, you know, a bartender who's in there on his day off. Uh, you know, my role is usually I better know your first and last name and what you drink. If not, uh, I'm going to need your, to your credit card just in case. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. And it sounds like you guys are always popping. So, <laughs> except now maybe. Uh, yeah. But yeah, that's. Uh, I think that that's the same problem for everybody. Um, what would you say is your average check? Uh, so it, that that definitely depends. I'd say our average two-person dinner check is between forty-five and sixty dollars. Our average beer drinker check uh, without eating is 15 to 25 dollars um so it's kind of somewhere in the middle of that to come up with a true number talking a little bit more about your demographics how would you categorize how would you categorize your guests uh, on the age groups? Like, is is about fifty percent of your customers millennials, or is is it eighty percent? You know, what's the percentage? It, it definitely it depends on the night. Uh, we we have a huge, very diverse crowd. Uh, we're very lucky that of us, uh, you know, we, we come from different uh, backgrounds, different age groups, and you know, on a it. I, I hate to say to put to put a cliche. We we get the perfect wave of what a restaurant wants on a saturday the lunch can be people coming in to watch penn state or whatever games on tv people walking the ab with their families by dinner it's almost all families where we we consider ourselves from the hours of five to eight to essentially be a family restaurant now on friday saturdays even thursdays after that 8 p.m., we've got all vinyl DJs. We do live bands in here. And it definitely, the age kind of goes down, but still stays from 21 to 45. Uh, you'll, you'll see groups of, you know, beer, beer drinking dads uh, and groups of, uh, you know, moms or, or women uh, hanging out, walking the ab together to just your college kids coming in, looking for a couple beers. We've kind of become, because of our hours, we close at 12 because we have a theory, nothing good happens after 12. Uh, we've essentially become what's known as the best pregame bar in our county, that people want to come here. Uh, they know it's gonna be a great crowd. They know it's gonna be safe, fun, good environment. And then you know, once 12 o'clock hits, if they're at the age they wanna go home, they go home. If they're at the age they want to go to uh, one of the louder bars, uh, they know how to get there. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's very smart. I have spoken to a few customers of ours over the years, and 
I've definitely heard, you know, some of their liquor licenses, they allow them to stay open longer, but they just don't do it because it doesn't make sense in terms of what's going to happen after midnight or 1 a.m. Your marketing efforts, um, sounds like it might be a little bit of a tricky uh, position there if you have so many different, you know, such a diverse group. Um, so can you talk to me a little bit about your events that you are doing or different collaborations that you are doing? How are you messaging? How, what messaging are you using? How are you marketing? Yeah, so from our, I've, I've always, you know, honestly, we don't, we don't do much besides, the you know, the norm. Like we've spent money on a couple of Facebook, you know, boosts and Instagram boosts and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, a lot of it's just been word of mouth and, and free, you know, getting on different radio shows and, Having the local newspaper write articles about us, um, we we, uh, we won best draft list of 2019, and that was posted in like Reader's Choice, yeah. um, and that's all been free. We just get on get on social media and we tell people to vote and reshare you know posts and stuff like that. So we've just honestly relied on strong you know strong clientele, word of mouth, and just the norm. Facebook, um, Facebook and Instagram, you know, really. Um, and then as far as events, you know, I'll let, you know, these guys get into some of the events we do, but he touched on, you know, live music and DJs and he did a, uh, what was the, the dark beer event? That was a pretty, you know, pretty huge event. Um, so we definitely try to do things like that to, 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 to get, to get more people in the door. Um, but nothing outside of the norm of social media. I think maybe as we grow, we might look into investing a little more in, in some stuff, but uh, as of now, you know, we just keep it keep it pretty simple. You We're also lucky enough to have uh, uh, the avenue that we are located on. They shut down uh, the whole avenue three times a year. Four times a year, the whole lab, but then there's eight major well, events. Eight major events on the avenue, um, which is kind of basically a free plug for us to begin with. Yeah. We're allowed to set up in the street out front of the business and sell alcohol and food out in the street. Um, which is always a good thing because they grab they grab close to fifteen to twenty thousand people yeah. <laughs> yeah, roll through in a weekend. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, so it's another one of those things that we're fortunate enough with our location that we get the opportunity to take advantage of things like that. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, the festival, yeah. the festival was a huge. De definitely event wise, we're we're lucky. Our our brand carries itself. We have all of the festivals. We also do a weekly array. Uh, Tuesdays we do an all you can eat crab leg night. Wednesdays we do trivia, Thursdays are acoustic music, Fridays are all vinyl DJs, Saturdays are house DJs, Sundays are brunch. We like to make sure there's something every day of the week that people know is going on. And then we do traditional beer events. Uh, ben and I have collabed on some food and beer pairings, as well as we've done a dark side of the wall event, being beer while we kind of played off of Roger Waters. Uh, and then unfortunately this year we had a Dine on you, Hazy Diamond, as well as our first anniversary event that we missed because of the pandemic, but we hope to reschedule for later on. Uh, I believe in doing, you know, aside from the festivals, a, a major event on our side uh, every other month, including our favorite was we did a beer dinner for New Year's and closed the restaurant and just did a 60 person ticket sold. Uh, dinner where Ben really got to truly show off some of the high-end culinary stuff he wanted to, and we were able to just have some outrageously cool beers and have kind of a private, uh, you know, kind of kind of night that was really fun. Ben, do you do something like suggestions, like pair this dish with this beer? Is that something um, you do? Yeah, we. Uh, I like to do that a lot with Josh when we when it comes to something that say we're gonna have. Um, a ta takeover or something like that where a brewery is going to give us three or four kegs of their stuff um, all different to kind of highlight their beers I like to take either some of their beer and incorporate it into what I'm doing or use their beer as a backbone for my flavor profiles that I'm going to be doing with my dish mm -hmm. and when it comes to the takeovers do you guys put some signage up around the beer wall or do you change the image that you're showing on the on the pour my beer screen how do you kind of make sure that you know this brewery is now getting more exposure than the other brands i guess uh we we put up a little bit of signage we don't change the beer wall screens we pretty much like to keep them all very uh consistent with what's going on really social media i mean free social media has taken off and when you're a place that's you know lucky enough that you have 5,000, 10,000 followers on Facebook, it 
the word of mouth and the social media traffic can really spread itself quickly. Uh, and the brewers that we work with, we will only do events like that where they're going to be present. Like we wanted to do an event that again, uh, our whole first anniversary week, we were going to do something every single day of the week. And we had one of my friends who owns Abomination Brewing Company who was going to come out, tap some really cool kegs that weren't going anywhere else but here and wanted to be present and be able to talk to people about what he was doing, how he was growing, his end of things. And, you know, the opportunity to meet a brewer to me is just so much different than, oh, we're going to have four beers from blah, blah, blah on today at a discounted price. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you back off of that. Last summer we did that that collaboration with uh with, with Bunk, Bunk, Bunk Brew that was all, yeah we had our own like i think josh went up there and helped brew this like light easy drinking ipa that we called funk on the wall and it was specifically made for us you know you obviously couldn't find it anywhere um so that was cool you know Funk brewing has a pretty strong name locally so just being able to, to partner with them and, and piggyback off of them kind of goes with his staying of you know crap years about collaboration not really competition so that, that was fun and it was it, it was it was really good too that sounds awesome and it does sound like so you said you have a brewery right across the street right yeah we have yeah there's two two yeah and do you look at them more as a partner or do you like, like, yeah. <laughs> so, so that, that that's definitely a fine line uh you know i'll <laughs> i'll be very honest about it Uh, we are very supportive of those breweries. We'll tell people, you know, where they are, go try their beer, but we don't carry them on draft. Uh, and, you know, I had one person who I won't say the brewery name. He came in, he's the GM for them. And he asked me, he was like, you know, uh, would, would you put a keg of ours on draft? And I said, you know, uh, will you give it to me at the same price you brew it for and put it on at your place? He said, no. I said, well, will you send me something that you're not going to tap at your brewery? He said, no. I said, well, then, unfortunately, there's just so much beer around and so many people I want to support locally and nationally that I can't put on your beer and justify it. But I'll be happy to tell people who come in and say, oh, where's another cool spot to go? Hey, this place is right there. They brew really awesome beer. You should try it. Mm -hmm. You're right. That sounds awesome. One more thing here in the marketing category. Do you guys have a loyalty program? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm always bringing it up with these guys. and We want to. We want to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do. It's just a matter of, I guess, getting with, you know, micros and uh, just seeing if, if, if there can be some kind of a, I guess, you know, easy integration with that. Right? It sounds like in the perfect world, right? We'd be able to track their ounces poured and... Maybe they get a, a point for every dollar they spend here, and then when they get 100 points, they get, you know, 50% off an appetizer or something like that. So we've definitely thought about it, and I think we'll eventually, we'll eventually pull it off. But as of now, we don't have a loyalty program in place, but we, it's, it's coming soon. It's, sure. definitely, it's definitely a lost opportunity there. I'm sure you have heard about 80-20 rule, so make sure to incorporate the loyalty program. I would say that that can really help you understand better, even further, your, your target market and just yeah, be um, either. On, on that topic, while we don't have a specific loyalty program, I do recommend things we've done. Uh, we've, we've used geofencing and we've used uh, text marketing, and both of those are incredible forms of marketing that kind of work just as well. Uh, we're hoping that, you know, between micros and pour my beer, uh, soon a really great way for us to do a loyalty brand with our specific cards in house is going to become possible. Uh, but also with uh, the price that those cards can sometimes be, uh, we we found that uh, geofencing and text message marketing uh, can be very cheap and easy ways to attract a lot of people and still have a loyalty program, especially with the tax marketing. So since you guys don't have the loyalty program, are your main key performance indicator and things that you measure, are those those sales that we have covered earlier, like food versus beverages? Are those things that you are probably you, Josh, are, the, are you reviewing them every week? You know, oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. We like to make sure that our food costs, our alcohol costs, our labor costs stay very specific. 
especially we change our menu three times a year around those times when we're going to have larger chucks, larger changeover and stuff. We like to make sure we keep a level of balance to how the numbers are going to go. Uh, we're very lucky that throughout things, we've been able to maintain really good target numbers uh, consistently and really, you know, kind of like what Josue said at the very beginning of this and to anyone looking to open an establishment, uh, you know, if you don't have 10 years in the industry, make sure you have a head chef uh, who does because uh, keeping food costs, keeping labor costs and alcohol costs are the key to you being able to make money and tracking and knowing those numbers is utmost importance. Yeah. If you don't mind sharing, what percentage um, is the labor cost accounting for? Our labor cost uh, tracks between 18 and 21 percent. Uh, we, we've had notions of wanting to get it lower, but we also really like to have a good size staff. Uh, Pour My Beer is excellent for being able to get labor costs as low as probably 5, 10 percent, uh, depending on where you're going. A traditional restaurant is usually between 15 and 25, 15 if you're great and 25 if you're heading towards that danger zone of what you're doing. Uh, so we're, we're very happy kind of floating in that middle, taking care of a really great staff that takes care of us. And part of being, of, of the way we've been able to grow and have word of mouth is people constantly saying, well, I come in here because Haley's working. I come in here because Shannon's working. Corey's working. I come in here because the food's so great. You know, I tell anyone, don't skimp on what you pay your line cooks. <laughs> Or the yeah. dishwasher. We, I, the, the unsullied, the, uh, the positions of the restaurant that do not get credit, your host food runner and your dishwasher, where I'm lucky to say uh, we opened April last year, uh, not this, obviously, this past year before. Uh, and in May, we hired a host and we hired a dishwasher, and they both are still here. They both work five days a week. And they are both taken care of because they are huge keys to the restaurant. I wanted to ask if you have some secret sauce <laughs> that you yeah. want to share with everyone that you think that particularly did make a big difference for beer wall on pen, or I guess now even also beer wall on prints. <laughs> I always say our secret sauce is us. That's, I mean, I've been asked that a lot. And you know, there's nothing proprietary about the restaurant industry, as we know. But you know, that's at least my secret sauce is, the, is these two gentlemen sitting next to me. Um, I don't mean that to sound cocky or anything. That's just you know how I feel, and you know that's really what separates us, you know, from from other places. You know, I've been told, hey man, we can do what you're doing, and I'm like, yeah, you can, but you're not going to have you know our team. So that's for me, at least. I feel like that's my secret sauce. Mm -hmm. I'll order and take that down the line from that. Trust your people. Uh, you know, if you've got a great person in every area of the restaurant that you can trust and that'll make your life easier, it frees you up to track the numbers, make the right decisions and, and establish, you know, your, your presence in the area, you know, ha have, a, have a team. Let's talk a little bit about COVID, our hot topic, our relevant topic. I, I wanted to hear what's your post-COVID strategy, what adjustment have you done? I think it's more suitable than ever that you have those two beverage walls too, so you can you know have some traffic in one, some traffic at the other. Uh, but what are some other tactics that you are implementing? Uh, there'll be two really important things that we're going to need to do with the wall uh, for customers. The first will be putting down footprints. Uh, letting people know how many people can be up at the wall at any given time. And just for our flair, uh, we plan to, rather than the traditional two yellow footprints or blue that you get from Ecolab, we have a friend who's going to do Trex feet or, you know, different cartoon characters just to make it a little bit more fun, but help people know, hey, you got to stand here and wait your turn. Uh, second to that is cleanliness, and cleanliness is more important than anything, especially in these times and the uncertainty of how this lives on surfaces. We plan to keep individual hand sanitizer wipes at the wall with little trash cans. 
Uh, we look at that as the best way that every single person who goes up there knows I can take a hand wipe, I can wipe what I'm going to touch or have the hand, the hand wipe in my hand while I open the tap and then throw it out so that there's not a mess. Um, we, we do employ someone whose job it is, is every 30 minutes normally to uh, wipe down the walls, keep them clean. They're probably going to be doing that a little bit more often, but you know, having the sanitizer wipes up there, you, you can't pay someone to stand around the entire day and just uh, spray the tap after every use. Yeah. Does this person normally serve as a beer ambassador, kind of educating everyone how it's working and what's good, what's not? And then like if, you know, if they're yes available, no. that's when they're cleaning? Is that? Um, yes and no. Originally, we relied on the bartenders, the servers more for that. Uh, but the person doing so uh, has become more and more beer educated mm -hmm. since we opened. And it's somewhat become like that, that that person is able to assist more in what type of beer, how do I use the taps, not just cleaning. Uh, but the person's job is also to run food and bus tables, so they're not able to help every single guest. Yeah. Besides the beer wall, what else are you doing as a part of your post-COVID strategy? Uh, basically the same thing every person is and should be doing. Follow all the CDC guidelines. Make sure your hand sanitizers are available for customers and all your staff. You know, uh, we're, we're lucky to say that our one-year health inspection, we had zero even remarks on there. They gave us an absolutely perfect run of house and kitchen. And, you know, you got to keep it that way. Make sure you're, you're doing what you have to, keeping things clean and making people feel safe without being so crazy to the point that uh, you lose your mind. Absolutely. Are you guys going to be doing plastic cups or anything like that that's going to be like reusable compared to if you used to use a glass? For the time being, we are just because of in Pennsylvania, the phase that we're in. But when we fully are allowed to reopen, we will use glassware. Uh, we will make sure that people know the rinsers on the wall are not for rinsing out your glass. They are for first usage. Uh, we have, you know, dish machines in the kitchen, dish machines behind the bar, making sure that everyone knows, use your glass, hand it to someone, leave it on one of the wood rails that's allowed in the restaurant. We'll take care of it. We'll make sure it's clean. Mm -hmm. I have one question here from Jason. He's asking if you guys are finding growler and crowler sales work the hassle. Uh, crowler sales are phenomenal. Uh, growler sales can be tough. We don't offer them. Uh, we don't make our own growler, uh, and depending on what type of system you had put in, whether or not you can lower the pressure of the taps from right out front, or how much room you have between your taps and your drip tray, they can be a little bit tough, but I mean, crowlers kind of saved the day through the month of April and May. Uh, and, and we always offer crowlers. They're just an additional way that any server who finishes a table, one of the last things they, they uh, say to their customers is, oh, is there a beer you really like? Because we can absolutely get you a 32 ounce crowler of it to go. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's like selling dessert, but better. <laughs> No, that's awesome. I, I love that take. I think that so many people can take advantage of this and really poor my beer location should. I, most of the people will fall, fall in love with something they try on the beer wall. And it's just yep. easy way to it's just easy way to increase that ticket. Yeah. Okay. Is there any other question or can we let the guys go and and go around their day? I think we have no more questions there. Um any final things you guys want to add or are you all good tired of speaking? Uh, we're good. We're good. We're just focused on Lancaster and, and hopefully get getting that one open in the next, you know, a few months um, and then just, just staying busy, you know, taking it one step at a time. And is there a dream about third location somewhere up there? Uh, the, the, yes. There's already, uh, we're already looking. Uh, well, we'll, we'll probably plan on a 2020 uh, unveiling what will be the next steps for the Beer Wall brand. And something in Colorado, or is it going to be Pennsylvania? <laughs> Maybe one day. I've got a couple friends out there. <laughs> well, now you have one more. Okay, so I guess Pennsylvania is the market, right? That would be the third location as well? 
Uh, for library, now. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's easier to stay local for sure to manage the businesses. All right, well, guys, thank you so much. We love having Birwa on pen as well as now Birwa on prints in the family. We appreciate that you took the time to chat with us today. This was really helpful. And again, thanks so much for being part of our fan. We love you guys. Thank you. Thank you.